Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to everyone in around the courtroom. This is case number IT0481T, the Prosca versus Montero Perisic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could we have our PRSs for the day, starting with the prosecution, please? Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning, Counsel. Good morning, everyone in the courtroom. Mark Harmon, April Carter, Corona McKenna, Barney Thomas, Rafaela Cruz, and Carmela Javier for the prosecution. Thank you very much, Mr. Harmon, and for the defense. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. D. Montgomery, Tina Drolich, Chad Mayer, Boris Zoko, Gregor Guy Smith, and Novak Lukic appearing on behalf of Mr. Perisic. Thank you, Mr. Guy Smith. Mr. Guy Smith. I guess before I, I start my uh, our remarks of today. As I was uh, looking over <coughs> uh, the transcript last night and noted two areas where I'd like to make uh, a correction and an addition. The correction is at page 14769 <coughs> at line 24. Uh, it indicates footnote 619. It should be footnote 1619. Also, when I was discussing uh, the issue of the Lilich Perisic intercept in regards to uh, figuring out a way of influencing Mr. Mladic, I mentioned at page 14791, lines 12 through 20, P86, P886, and I would like to add to that P1464. Uh, I'd like to turn my attention now to the uh, discussion uh, that has been had with regard to uh, the issue of Zuch. It is, it is absolutely clear from the discussions that have been had concerning uh, much of the evidence. But clearly, when it comes to the issue of Zuch, that although there's an agreement on many of the facts, the perception of how one is to interpret uh, those facts is quite distinct. The prosecution presented evidence of a military operation. The chamber received evidence that that military operation was a failure, that uh, men from the 72nd died, that territory was lost, and that the purpose of that particular operation, that being capturing, <coughs> holding, and controlling Zuch, did not occur. Now, whether there would have been a different result, and whether that would have had a substantial effect on the commission of crimes is no longer an issue which is on the table because there was not a different result. It was a limited incident, incident and there is no evidence that was offered to the chamber that establishes a nexus between the failed operation in Zuch and the bombing or shelling of Sarajevo. The fact that both of these incidents occurs in and of itself does not establish a nexus. It would be convenient if it did, but it doesn't. 
and by indicating that two separate factual matters occurred does not establish proof that there is a relationship between them or in this particular situation that there was a substantial effect, which is the test. Furthermore, I think it's very uh, important that the chamber uh, go back and uh, carefully review the cross-examination of MP11 with regard to um, his claimed status. And I will um, leave it at that in terms of any further discussion in, in open session. And I will not go into private session. However, his assertion uh, that he was present um, at a meeting. Don't you think you should go into private session? Very well. Uh, Very well. I think you should. May the chairman please move into private session. We're in open session, Thank you. You also have received other testimony uh, with regard to the issue of Perisic's presence, and that was from um, Zlatko Danilovic. And Zlatko Danilovic was specifically asked whether he saw whether he ever saw General Perisic. He answered he did not. And he was asked whether or not uh, he ever heard about General Perisic being present. And once again, his answer was that he had not. The conclusion drawn by Ms. Carter in her argument yesterday that they have established a nexus is inaccurate and wanting. The prosecution has failed to prove and the defense contention that there is no nexus as between uh, Zuch and the crimes charged remains. There's one other thing which is somewhat of, of some um, moment with regard to the argument that was made um, by Ms. Carter, and that was the use of the term trained snipers. Um, I don't think that there would be any dispute that snipers are, in fact, used um, in war. They are legitimate manner of fighting. And the fact that there were trained snipers at the failed operation does not forward the prosecution's case whatsoever. Um, it is, of course, something that will, um, I suggest, uh, potentially uh, Cause, cause some um, thought since there is an issue and there's been a discussion in which the word sniper has been used as it, related, as it relates to Sarajevo. But the fact that, once again, there are trained snipers in a failed military operation does not necessarily in any fashion whatsoever establish that there was a substantial effect on whatever crimes were committed in Sarajevo. In the absence of there being a nexus, there has been a failure of proof. Uh, Mr. Harmon, in his opening remarks, mentioned, as did I, um, that a fair amount of this case is based on circumstantial evidence. And I wish to just spend a moment uh, reading um, a definition of that, because I think it's of critical importance to this chamber's consideration. Circumstantial evidence may be of no less substance than direct evidence. However, the trial chamber must be cautious not to draw inferences based upon assumptions rather than proven facts. 
as pointed out by the trial chamber in Kroniak, while, quote, a number of different circumstances which, taken in combination, point to the existence of a particular fact upon which the guilt of the accused depends because they would usually exist in combination only because a particular fact did exist. Such a conclusion must be the only reasonable conclusion available. I repeat those, the last phrase, the only reasonable conclusion available. If there is another conclusion available, Mr. Parasich is entitled to the benefit of that conclusion. Finally, once again in terms of the issue of uh, perception, I want to uh, discuss very briefly the issue of the French pilots and the measure of the man and what Perisic did. Now, we all recall that uh, at the time that individuals went to get the French pilots, there was the Paris Peace Conference, days away. We have received direct evidence from the highest of sources that the following was on the table. Quote, we were rapidly approaching the formal peace conference in Paris. However, President Chirac had declared that it could not take place until two French pilots captured by the Bosnian Serbs when their aircraft was shot down over a palais on August the 30th had been released. There was no reason to doubt his determination to make the meeting in Paris conditional on the release of the pilots. I'm a simple lawyer. I work in courtrooms. Just, just before you go to the simple lawyer, uh, as you quote, can you give us the, the speaker and the reference? Absolutely. The speaker is Carl Bildt. The reference is page 14314, lines 5 through 10. Mr. Grassman. Surely. I still remain a, speak, a simple lawyer. And I don't understand how nations negotiate. I don't understand what's put on the table. But one thing is very clear. If the pilots had not been released, there would have been no Paris conference based on the information that has been presented to this court. If there was no Paris conference, there would have been no Dayton Peace Accord. Not only was a nation waiting for the return of these two gentlemen, the world was waiting for the return of these two gentlemen. And the issue of peace and the cessation, cessation of hostilities was conditioned 
upon this release. And the evidence that you have received is that General Perisic was instrumental <coughs> in obtaining the conditions that allowed for that release and allowed for the peace process to move forward. I turn uh, the balance of um, our remarks at this time over uh, to Mr. Lukic. In the event that I have failed to say anything with regard to those issues um, that I have addressed or that were the subject matter of my discussion, I am not concerned. I do apologize, but I am not concerned. And the reason for that is, under this system, where the prosecution has the proof and bears that burden of the proof beyond reasonable doubt, you, the chamber, the fact finders, are the final hurdle that the prosecution must satisfy. And you, the chamber, hold that particular obligation and that particular task. And I'm confident that you will exercise that duty fully, responsibly, and with great analysis and care. Thank you. Mr. 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 Lukic. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to our colleagues from the prosecution. Good morning to all the participants in these proceedings, especially to the interpreters who are now going to give their contribution to these proceedings of ours. I'm going to be speaking in my mother tongue. Your Honours, the first part of my remarks will be channeled towards challenging the charges that through his actions, General Perisic provided the personnel to the VRS and the SVK, and in this way that contributed to the crimes that occurred in Sarajevo. Finally, I'm going to speak about command responsibility, and ultimately I will be speaking about the personality of Mr. Perisic and some of his personal characteristics. According to the indictment, General Perisic continued with the practice of financing and providing most of the personnel who comprised the officer cadre of the VRS. The defense never denied that part of the officer's personnel, I repeat, part of the officer's personnel of the VRS and for whom the prosecution claims was were members of the Army of Yugoslavia were financed by the Army of Yugoslavia. However, the thesis is based on the contribution given to that by the personnel centers and 
Previously, it is explained on the basis of ad hoc departures based on a voluntary joining of the troops there. The prosecution is avoiding the wider evidence, as it were, what happened previously, how this functioned, and what happened after General Perisic was appointed Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia in August 1993. We do not wish to ignore that. When trying the facts, the trial chamber has to judge the actions of the accused, determining his personal participation, contribution to the commission of crimes, and that has to be significant. In our view, Your Honours, that means that you have to establish what General Perisic's significant contribution was to providing those officers in relation to the situation that prevailed before he became Chief of General Staff, especially the extent to which personnel centers affected this personnel. Let us be quite specific on this. The defense claims that the prosecution has not proven beyond reasonable doubt that since Perisic was appointed Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia, there were no significant changes in providing officers for the Army of Republika Srpska, and especially the stability and efficacy of these officers that the prosecution refers to was not increased in any way. The first question that I would like us to deal with in relation to these divergent positions between the parties is who comprised the personnel of the Army of Republika Srpska from the moment when that army was established. The next question is what and to what, ex what extent General Perisic changed, which would constitute the actus reus of his incriminations among the, sta the personnel of Republika Srpska. It is important for you to establish in this respect, Your Honours, whether the prosecutor proved their contention that the personnel centers maintained the vitality of that army and that they made the command structure of that army sustainable, in Mr. Harmon's words. Who were the officers that comprised the command structure of the Army of Republika Srpska? According to the prosecution, they were officers of the Army of Yugoslavia. The defense asserts that the majority of these officers had the status of initially officers of the Army of Republika Srpska and that that was their status throughout the war. When the law on the Army of Republika Srpska was passed in June 1992, P191, that is the relevant exhibit, of their own free will, they became active duty personnel of the Army of Republika Srpska in accordance with Article 377 of that law. There is a great deal of testimony and references to that effect in our final brief, and I'm not going to quote any of that specifically now. From that moment onwards, they became part of that single chain of command. They had their actual place within the establishment, and in any army, there can be only one for one particular officer. They 
held their respective ranks, their respective positions, they had their uniforms, they had their insignia, their emblems, stating that they belonged to the Army of Republika Srpska. They had their own oath, and they had their own subordinates, interpreters, correction, superiors. They had orders, Naredjenja and Naredbe, that they obeyed. According to the army, the law on the Army of Republika Srpska, they saw what the consequences would be if they did not obey these orders, what the specific responsibility involved was if they did not obey these orders. In a word, they were part of a functioning army within their chain of command established by law. Your Honours, there was nothing untruthful or concealed within that chain of command. Nothing was fictitious either. Nothing whatsoever. The prosecution wishes to attach importance to the moment when personnel centers were established. And within that task of theirs, they are disregarding what happened before the personnel centers were established and after the Army of Republika Srpska was established, D242 and P1864, may I remind you, these are documents of the presidency of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, are decisions of the top state leadership of the then Yugoslavia, recognizing the rights of these officers, like other members of the JNA. And this happened as far back as May 1992, that is to say a year and a half before the personnel centers were founded and before General Perisic was appointed Chief of General Staff. And not only that, these two documents set the criteria for their remaining in that army. Members of the JNA who have citizenship of the BH or who wish to remain in the territory of BH are the main criterion for having them stay on and constituting the very core of the officer's core of that army. These criteria were set considerably for before General Perisic became Chief of General Staff. On this occasion, I don't want to deal with numbers in detail, Your Honours. We provided part of our analysis in our final brief in paragraphs 326, 33, all the way up to 330. However, I would like to draw your attention to D113. That is a report of General Života Panic, the then Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia from August 1993, just before Perisic took over the position of Chief of General Staff. On the basis of that report, you will see that the salaries for July 1993 were received by 2,894 officers commissioned and non-commissioned from the VRS. and. 1,186 officers from the SVK, so the total is 4,080. Yeah. Is it the defense position that 
if a particular activity had been taking place before Mr. Perisic took over the position of Chief of the General Staff, and for argument's sake, that activity is criminal. And he comes in and continues with that activity. And therefore, he is not guilty of that criminal activity simply because the crime had started before he came in? Is that the position? No. Ne, ja ovdje govorim. Ne, ja ovdje. No, no. I am referring to other arguments here. And you will probably come to that point. Dakle, ja sam u ovim brojkama iz ovog dokumenta... When I refer to these figures from these documents, I included those officers from the Army of Yugoslavia who, according to that report, were sent in the meantime to the Army of Republika Srpska because that is the category that the prosecution included among the persons who are involved in setting up this officer's corps of the Army of Republika Srpska. The figures are very specific and exact in that document. The defense asserts that from the moment when General Perisic was appointed Chief of General Staff until the end of the war, this number of officers who were serving in the Army of Republika Srpska and the Serb Army of the Kraina and were financed by the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia never attained these numbers, these levels, the figures that I just provided. We have provided relevant proof about that as well in our final brief. Now, why does the defense believe that it is important for you to have these figures? They show the absence of any change in the structure of this officer's corps after the personnel centers were established. And that is what the prosecution has been contending. The establishment of personnel centers did not make it possible for an increase in the officer's core, as the prosecution contends. On the contrary, there was a decline in those figures. That is one of the defects of the personnel centers. Another important position of the OTP, starting from the indictment itself and Mr. Harmon's opening arguments, is that the most important positions in the VRS and the SVK were held by officers who were members of the 30th and 40th personnel centers of the Army of Yugoslavia. The prosecution asserts in their wish to show how significant General Perisic's contribution was to providing those officers. They say that he, General Perisic, provided a group of essential officers, in their words, for the, who were responsible for the crimes in Sarajevo and Srebrenica. That is paragraph 463 and 503 of the final brief of the prosecutor. The prosecution exploits this thesis through their famous, I'm going to use that word because they refer to it so many times in court. It is diagram or schedule E. By using it, they want to portray a picture of General Perisic's role in the maintenance and stability of this essential part of the officer's core of the VRS.
you heard witness Skrbic on all of that. Page reference 11660 of the transcript. We spoke about that in our final brief. Now, this is our position. All the officers in the key positions in the Army of Republika Srpska, including the officers that the prosecution defines as being essentially and basically responsible for the commission of crimes, were appointed to these positions considerably before Perisic came to the position of Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia, that is to say considerably before the personnel centers were established. Now, what are the activities of General Perisic and the personnel centers with regard to their position and the fact that they remained in those positions that they had held already? We haven't heard about that during the trial. You are asked to speculate as to whether they would leave the Army of Republika Srpska and their positions and duties had these personnel centers not been established and had General Perisic not come to the position of Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia. Let us look at the diagram that I'm talking about. You're going to see that on your screens. That is Schedule E of the final brief of the prosecution. Mr. Harmon referred to it in his opening remarks. It says what all the names and ranks and positions are within the Army of Republika Srpska. And it says that each and every one of these persons are members of the 30th Personnel Center. That is the position of the prosecution. Now let us look at what this organigram looks like within the Army of Republika Srpska at the moment when Perisic became Chief of General Staff. Or rather, who came to these positions after the personnel centers were established? Empty. The same mechanism that Mr. Harmon showed you? By applying the same method, I'm showing this to you. Not a single officer came to the Army of Republika Srpska from among these essential basic officers of the Army of Republika Srpska after Perisic was appointed Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia and after the personnel centers were established. There were some internal changes in terms of these duties. We know that General Dragomir Milosevic replaced General Galic. But all of the persons we saw a moment ago were already in the VRS before Perisic, General Perisic, became Chief of General Staff. It is clear, Your Honors, that the entire structure of the command personnel, the essential personnel of the VRS, was within that army. They had the status of members of that army considerably before Perisic became Chief of General Staff of the Army of Yugoslavia. Their position in the VRS has occasionally been changed within the framework of the VRS completely independently of the VJ and General Perisic. No matter how hard the prosecution tried to prove that General Perisic did have a role in their appointments to the positions in the VRS, which enabled them or put them in a position of authority enabling the commission of crimes, they failed to prove that. Contrary to that, the defense put forth a number of uh, exhibits in, uh, proving 
that they were appointed to those positions by those uh, responsible in the VRS itself. I invite you to uh, look at paragraphs 272 to 301 of our final brief. Out of the two groups of documents I have just indicated, what it is that you can conclude? In terms of the number of personnel, the officer cadre of the VRS, as well as the most important positions of that army, the situation vis-à-vis -vis the time when they were in position of authority enabling the commission of crime did not change. That situation uh, existed uh, far in advance of Mr. Perisic's appointment. Your Honours, the prosecution did interpret correctly Mr. Perisic's position, however, in his clearly articulated position that those who hailed from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia and who did not wish to fight for their own homeland and who were VJ officers, in his view, had no place in the VJ. He said so publicly. It is a legitimate position of a professional soldier and a patriot. However, the evidence we could see during the proceedings speak to his inability to persuade um, members of the Supreme Defense Council to accept such a firm position, which would be binding uh, on him uh, because he was uh, put in that position by uh, his superior, the superior being the Supreme Defense Council. When his proposal was rejected by the SDC, Perisic lost his position of authority, which would enable him to do to order something to anyone to do some anything. He lost his power to issue an order from his position of uh, the superior to send anyone to the VRS. His order, therefore, did not have a binding nature, a binding character, no matter how hard the prosecution tried to prove that when uh, dealing with his de jure authority. Had those orders been true and real, no other mechanisms would have been necessary that were shown to you by the prosecution for anyone to be sent to the VRS. That situation also tells another thing. It shows that when an officer is formally appointed to a position within the 30th or 40th personnel center, that could have happened only by virtue of his voluntary departure to the VRS or the SVK. General Perisic speaks to that effect when, in paragraph 145 of the prosecution's final brief, uh, they refer to it. If somebody objected to being appointed to such a virtual, I dare say, position in the 30th and 40th personnel center, or in other words, sent to the VRS or the SVK, 